I am Brian Noyce. Uh, this session is to give you a quick intro to the Aurelia framework. Uh, if you didn't notice up there, the URL at the top, snap a picture now or I'll, I'll put it back up at the end. Uh, but you can download all the slides and demos from there or from the uh, conference site where all the other ones are. They've all been updated to uh, exactly what I'm going to be showing here today. A uh, little background on myself. I'm from a company called Alliance. We do uh, art architecture consulting, expert uh, engagements, anything from short um, kind of mentoring sessions with an expert in a given technology. From our partner network, we have about, uh, we have over 100 people in our par partner network, mostly MVPs or top experts on certain technologies uh, that we can pull in on projects. And we also do end-to-end -end project development for companies that either don't have their own dev staff or their dev staff their dev staff can't scale to uh, whatever their current demands are. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft Regional Director. If you haven't heard about that program, you can check it out at that URL. There's about 150 of us worldwide now, picked by Microsoft, somewhat similar to the MVP program, um, but a little more direct conduit to senior leadership at my Microsoft instead of just being product team focused uh, like the MVPs are. I'm also a Pluralsight author and very relevant to the session today. I have the uh, Aurelia Fundamentals course on Pluralsight. So if you're not a Pluralsight subscriber and you want to check it out, just send me an email there, brian.noise at gmail, and I can get you a one month pass to check it out. And got a whole bunch of other courses uh, in the library as well. But the, the main one that's relevant here would be the Aurelia Fundamentals, almost 12 hours kind of end in coverage of all aspects of Aurelia. Okay, so first off, we're going to talk a little bit about prerequisites. Let me survey the crowd a little bit here to get a feel for things. How many of you are web developers already? Probably most of you. Um, how many have been using front-end frameworks like Angular or Knockout? About half, okay. Uh, Angular 2 Plus? Only a couple, okay. Uh, anyone done any real work with Aurelia other than playing around? Okay, good. So, you know, part of my intent with this session is to give you a feel for what Aurelia is capable of doing, uh, even if you have been exposed to Angular and you're trying to consider which one to, uh, to do. Both of those share a, kind of a common set of prerequisites in terms of knowledge of uh, ECMAScript 2015 and later and, and or TypeScript um, and some of the build environment you has, have to set up when you're working with these modern front end web dev tools. And I'll show you some of that as we go here. Then we'll obviously get into what Aurelia is capable of as a framework and go through a few demos to, uh, to give you a feel for how things like data binding, dependency injection, and so on uh, come into play here. One of the more confusing aspects of, and this isn't just Aurelia's problem, it's also Angular 2 Plus's problem, is, and React for that matter, is modern web dev, you have to do, uh, you know, have to create a project with some infrastructure that can build, bundle, deploy, uh, run a development environment for you and all that kind of stuff. And there's a number of different options to go with there. Um, but that's, I find that people have more, uh, have a harder time getting used to just using all the tooling that you need than they do just learning the framework APIs and stuff once they get past that. So you'll see some of that today, what the options are, and I'll make some recommendations there. And then finally, like I said, we'll kind of step through the, the three key building blocks of the framework that you'll need for any really app that you build is generally to do some data binding. If you're not doing that, there's almost no point in uh, using a front end framework, using routing to have client side navigation between pages or views within your app, and then dependency injection to tie them all to all the different uh, components together in a loosely coupled way. Now, I'll address this quickly. I don't want it to become a big uh, sidetrack, but you know, this is one of the biggest questions that people often have, uh, especially if they've spent some time looking at Angular uh, and they're considering Aurelia. So, you know, the, the joke here with the elephant in the room is, is just that Angular is huge. As, as I'm sure you all know in terms of the community out there, the popularity of the Angular 1 framework uh, and therefore the, the presumption that everyone who's using Angular 1 should migrate to Angular 2 at some point. The truth is that 
you know, that there is no technical reason to pick one over another. There's no technical superiority that, you know, anyone can clearly say this one is clearly technical but better or faster or whatever. They're both excellent frameworks. Um, it really comes down more to uh, design aesthetic. They both have a, kind of a different approach to things. Aurelia takes a convention over configuration approach and tries to minimize the amount of noise and repetitive stuff you have to put in your code. Angular kind of goes the other direction and says you'll configure the crap out of everything and you'll do it over and over and over again in every single component you create with Angular 2. Uh, and there's pros and cons to both those. You know, one is less noise in the code, but it leaves more guessing for someone who's new with that code base. One is really noisy in the code, but everything's right there in your face. There's no magic happening that's, that's not really dictated by the code you're looking at. So there's pros and cons to both of those. Um, I did an article on the Pluralsight blog that kind of goes into more detail on some of these aspects you can check out. Uh, and I did a .NET Rocks uh, interview uh, that we talked some about that as well. So those links are there for you to you know, dig in more there. If it came down to I'm starting a brand new project and uh, I have my free choice, you know, the customer comes to me and says, which do you think is, is a better framework? I would tend to pick Aurelia. Um, Angular has a lot more momentum behind it, has a lot bigger audience, and usually that is what wins because that also translates into more developer resources available, more articles and blog posts and tutorials and plural site courses and so on out there for you to learn the stuff. So that's the one thing that really you can't, you know, really conquer at this point because it is a much smaller audience. It's not tiny. It's thousands of people uh, involved in their Gitter channel and, and with the development of it and so on. Um, but it definitely doesn't have the automatic audience that Angular does. Uh, both these kinds of frameworks and React is the same way, Knockout's the same way, fall into the genre of single page apps. And so I just wanted to talk briefly about the, the architecture here. Uh, how many people, uh, I'm sorry, I already asked that one, never mind. Um, so when you're building a single page app or front end web application, uh, as they're sometimes called, or just JavaScript apps, you, um, basically you're really building a smart client that's gonna run in the browser. So the architecture here is very similar to writing a, a WPF app that's a distributed client app that's gonna go on multiple desktops and talk to backend services. Uh, just some of the stack that you'll use will be different instead of say using XAML for your markup and your UI. In a WPF app, you're gonna use HTML and CSS for that part and for your logic obviously it's going to be JavaScript even if you write it as TypeScript keep in mind TypeScript compiles to JavaScript so that's what you're going to uh, be running at runtime there <coughs> and then you're going to have some kind of web APIs on the back end that you're talking to where the data business logic and stuff of your shared back end uh, exists and then you're going to have a piece that renders out your spa, which could just be a web server that serves up static files. Because like with Angular 1, you could just serve up your HTML and your JavaScript files and have it all kind of come together in the browser at runtime. As you move into Aurelia and Angular 2 Plus and React, you do more development time compilation to create the JavaScript that's going to run at runtime. But you write in a higher level language, either ES 2015 and later or TypeScript. <clears throat> and do stop me at any time if there's questions. So in terms of the languages you pick, um, the terminology here, if you're not familiar, ECMAScript is the standard that defines the JavaScript language. JavaScript in any given browser is really just an implementation of the ECMAScript standard that's current or some part of, of what's current. So in 2015, um, that was the first one where they started using year numbers. As that was in development, people were referring to it as ES6, ECMAScript 6. Um, so ECMAScript 6 and 2015 are mostly interchangeable. Some people still use like 7 and 8 to refer, and refer to uh, 2016, 2017. But the standards body has completely gone away from that you know, sequential numbering. They're just using the years now. <coughs> 2016 had almost nothing in it. At least there was pretty much zero in it that would change the code you write. The only thing that was in it was two little things about, you know, kind of behind the scenes stuff in, at runtime uh, that doesn't really affect what you write. 2017 has a few minor features like that syntactically, um, but the big one that comes in with ES 2017 is async await support, just like we have in C Sharp. So you'll see that in one of my demos. 
TypeScript is generally going to be your better choice, and TypeScript is a sub, uh, superset of JavaScript and, and the more recent versions of JavaScript, for that matter. And uh, you know, TypeScript was kind of it had been out for a long time, a couple of years. It had a little bit of adoption, and it wasn't until Google decided to use uh, TypeScript to build the Angular 2 framework that all of a sudden everyone's like, "Whoa! If it's good enough for them to you know use a competitor generated language, maybe we should start looking at it." So TypeScript's really becoming the the default, the recommendation for any kind of modern front end uh, front end web client like this. <coughs> Now, ES5, uh, it is possible. I mean, ultimately, when you do the compilation, your code compiles down to ECMAScript 5 compatible code for the most part, um, because not all the browsers fully support all the features in, in the most recent ECMAScript standards there. And what they use for that, actually, let me do this a little di different order based on the way I'm talking. Let's get past all this. Let's just do it the quicker way. Um, if you haven't heard, uh, or I'm sure you've heard of, but maybe, you know, just kind of aren't sure what it is. When you hear people talk about transpiling and, and polyfills, transpiling just means you're taking one higher level language and turning it into another higher level language. You know, we compile our C Sharp into Microsoft Intermediate Language. We transpile our TypeScript into ECMAScript 5 that the browser can run. So it's the same basic concept, you know, it's ultimately it's parsing syntax trees and all that kind of stuff like any compiler does. It's just doing it between higher level languages instead of down to what would be considered a machine language. Polyfills are a little different. Those are for actual constructs that you're going to create in your code like you would from some third party library that are supposed to be part of the language spec itself. So a good example of this would be promises are one of the things that came in with ES 2015 as a native part of the JavaScript environment instead of having to use some third party library. But if you're running in a browser that doesn't have that support yet, you just slip in a polyfill library that has a object that has the exact same API as the spec has that the browser will eventually support, and you're just calling through that library instead. So the primary uh, transpilation and polyfill uh, support that you'll see is a framework called Babel that tr does this translation not only for things like TypeScript down into ES5 uh, code, but also for things like LESS and SAS compilation and getting those all pulled together uh, and using things that the browser supports. So. In terms of what's new, I'm just going to get through all the build here. Lots of stuff, and this all came in pretty much with ES 2015. Pretty much fundamentally changed the way you would write your JavaScript. Even if you're not using TypeScript, if you use the key features of ES 2015, your code looks completely different than any JavaScript you wrote in Angular 1, Knockout, any other front-end web dev stuff. Uh, some of the key ones here that, that kind of shape your code like that are modules. Modules solve kind of a long-term problem in JavaScript is that if you go into one of your JavaScript files and you just, let me just pseudocode it out here. You know, we drop into one of our, our uh, JavaScript files and we declare a variable foo. And then we script include this. Well, foo is now in the global namespace. And if I pull in another library after my library that also declares a foo in the global namespace, there's just stomps on top of mine. So what people have been doing for years to work around that in ES5 is to use something that's called an iffy, immediately invoked function expression. And you'll see this kind of construct at the top and bottom of you know, any sample Angular 1 app you, you go look at, for example. And so this is just to make it so that if I declare foo in here, that's just scope to that function, because var variables in the S5 are function scope, not block scoped. And so this was a way of kind of creating a feel of modularity that that file only exposes things that it really wants to, not everything it declares. Um, but now we have this concept of modules that formalizes that. And basically what modules do is they say that any individual um, file that you're loading up, if you load it as a module as opposed to just script including it, then it will have some isolation uh, that you didn't have before. And we'll see that in the code shortly. 
Uh, next one is classes. So now we have a semi-object-oriented JavaScript. Uh, it supports you know, declaring classes, treating them as a type, uh, inheriting from base classes, polymorphism, encapsulation, all the core tenets of object orientation there. The one thing you don't have at an ES2015 level that you do have in TypeScript is visibility. So in, in uh, ES2015, everything's public on your class. In TypeScript, you can use public, private, protected to control that a little bit better. Promises, like I said, those are a built-in thing of the language now, and we'll see those in the code. Uh, arrow functions, just like Lambda expressions. Same syntax, same concepts. If you're up to speed on C-sharp Lambda expressions, you're now up to speed on ES2015 arrow functions. Uh, let variables solve that scoping problem that I meant, mentioned. So var variables in ES5, you could declare it as the last line of code in a function. You use that variable in the first line of a function. Declare it down inside of an if block and use it outside of that if block, which is just kind of weird compared to most languages. So the guidance now is don't use var anymore if you're using ES2015 or TypeScript. Always use let or, I didn't highlight it over here, but const variables. Constant similar to, to the concept in, in uh, .NET, <laughs> but uh, they're a little more aggressive in terms of the TypeScript recommendations for, uh, for const. In, in .NET code, typically you're only gonna create a const for something that is truly invariant over time. And if it's something that you might have to you know, tweak the value in a subsequent release or something, the guidance for a long time has been use read-only variables instead of constant variables because they're actually compiled kind of differently and the way they get exposed from an object is different in .NET. None of that's true about the, the JavaScript side. Basically, if you're creating something that will only be assigned to once, use const. And if you're using something like TSLint that does static uh, analysis of your code, it's gonna make that recommendation every time you try to use the, uh, the let variable and only assign to it once. String templates, uh, just like C-sharp 6, the new kind of strings we have with a dollar sign out in front of them. A little bit different syntactically, the dollar sign goes inside the, the string uh, with, with these variables, and you'll see those in the demo, uh, but similar in comp set that you can plug things in in a printf or a uh, string.format kind of way. All right, so as I said, TypeScript piles on top of that and does all of what I just talked about, so it inherits all those new things from ES2015. In fact, it implemented many of those things, and they were part of the TypeScript standard before they were part of the ECMAScript standard. Um, and it adds a few things, so decorators. Decorators and class properties are kind of a weird one because they've been like in the approval process forever since back when ES6 was you know, still being talked about. And for some reason they haven't standardized them even though they're a very simple concept. Uh, but decorators are basically like attributes in .NET. They're a piece of metadata you can attach to some other declaration. Class properties are just a, a more brief way of defining a property that's part of a class. And so TypeScript does, it's part of the TypeScript language, but it's not officially part of the ECMAScript language yet. <coughs> uh, strong typing is probably the biggest thing you get that's different there is that now, you know, once you assign a variable, let's say you assign a string into it, the compiler is not going to let you then assign a 42 into it or, you know, another instance of a different type. So you're going to get type safety both at the compilation stage and if you're using decent tools like Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, you're going to get syntax highlighting whenever you have things that are inappropriate there in terms of typing. Uh, you do get a full generics capability like we have in C-sharp. Uh, that's not part of the ECMAScript standard. And uh, I mentioned me member visibility and interfaces are a first class type in the type system of, of TypeScript uh, and have you know, very similar properties to what we have in .NET that you can't have implementation defined on an interface. It's just there to define an API that some instance is going to implement. <coughs> One thing that's a little different that feels a little weird in TypeScript if you're new to it is you'll see defining something like a customer interface, but then there's never any customer type. If all it's gonna have is properties, you can declare those properties as an interface, and then you can actually kind of new it up and have an instance of that without actually declaring it separately as a class and then implementing that interface like we would in .NET. Okay, so just to show you some quick examples of these. Uh, let me go into 
go into the uh, saw one here. Okay, so this is a uh, kind of an endpoint uh, demo from the workshop I'll be giving tomorrow if you end up coming to that. Uh, but this is basically kind of a fully implemented sample application in Aurelia. And this one was generated using um, what's called JavaScript services. It's a set, set of templates that the ASP.NET Core team has created that you can use to generate a project. You can work with it at the command line with the .NET command and use your editor of choice like VS Code, or you can open it up as a CSPROJ in a Visual Studio solution. Uh, so you can work in both those environments. If I fire up code in here, Actually, you know what, I'm gonna to jump to another one that I was gonna to do tomorrow, and I'll just bring it up real quick here and add it to the demos later. So let's go in here and open this one. Just to focus on the language features first. Okay, so here, uh, ignore the async for a moment, I'll get to that, but just to kind of run through some of those, those constructs to get you familiar here. Uh, this is just a simple HTML. It's going to pull in as a script a bundle, which doesn't exist in my code. So it's gonna need a compilation step. This one was created, uh, let's see, this one was created with what? This looks to me, oh yeah, this one's got gulp as the way we're gonna compile and uh, run. So it's got a gulp file in here that has some tasks for, for using this Watchify and Browserify to do all the transpilation, copying things over to a disk directory and running from there. You can see this gulp destination disk down here. There's a whole course on gulp in the Pluralsight library if you wanna get up to speed on that. I just put this in here as a very lightweight, uh, non-intrusive to the project way of, of having this, this code running, you know, not depending on any frameworks like Angular or anything else. So once that bundle gets created, it's really bundling up my code here, and the entry point is this main uh, file. Simply because this is just a, it, it's a, a TypeScript module or an ES2015 module at this point. And part of that is you see this import statement, and then if we go over, for example, two simple class, you see export statements. So that's how the modularity works in ES2015 and TypeScript is that all your declarations in a single file, as long as they're brought in as an import, not through a script include, everything declared in there is private basically until you put the export keyword on it. That makes it accessible. It's like putting public on a type in .NET so that someone else can then import that type and start using it, much like putting a using statement in code to gain access to a namespace and the types within it. So whenever you see these import exports here, that's all part of that modularity aspect of ES2015 and TypeScript. Here you can see inheritance, you know, a little bit different syntactically. You use an extends keyword. Uh, we've got a base class down here. It's got a base method. You can call that base method right here in the code. I've got it commented out, but you can see, you know, that's declared on the base. The derived class, simple class, inherits from that, and it's public by default, as I mentioned. So it's accessible to be called through an instance of the simple class. Uh, let's see, some of the other stuff I talked about. Let's go in here. Here's that string template syntax I talked about. Instead of in C Sharp, we have dollar sign quotes, and then you have the curly braces for placeholders within that string. Here you put the dollar sign, or I'm sorry, you use uh, back ticks instead of single ticks or double ticks for your string. And then you have dollar sign curly braces are the places where you're plugging in values based on either local or member variables. And this is just there to kind of emphasize that what's in those curly braces is an expression that can be executed. So, you know, you could call a function, get the return from that, call another function, add it together. Whatever that produces is what will be injected uh, as a string into the placeholder here. Uh, let's see, anything else I missed here? I wanted to, oh, arrow functions. Take a look there. Uh, so here you can see in my set timeout, I'm using an arrow function, AKA a lambda in .NET. And um, one of the key aspects of arrow functions to be aware of is that they make it so that this keyword actually makes sense 
unlike JavaScript before it. So I'm sure you know anyone who has Java ex uh, JavaScript experience has dealt with the confusion of the this keyword and the fact that if you're in something like an async callback, this doesn't mean the object that callback function is declared on. This means whatever was calling into that, which it can be the runtime, it can be the window object, kind of changes depending on how that chunk of code is called. If you use a narrow function in TypeScript or, or ES2015, this means this inside the body of that function. And as you can see, it can have curly braces to you know, have that function be as long as you need it to be. But this dot name will resolve against the name property up here because of the arrow function. If I change that, where was that, right here. If I change that to just say function with no arguments and get rid of the arrow, now this is this dot name is going to throw an exception because it's an async callback by the runtime when the timeout ticks off and this doesn't mean th this in here anymore because it's just part of a normal javascript function so that's that's a key one to be aware of okay i don't want to get too sidetracked on the infrastructure here let's leave some time for the actual topic so one other piece of uh, infrastructure to mention is package management and module management so Everyone's heard of NuGet, obviously. Bower was popular for a while in terms of client-side libraries you'd use in a JavaScript app. Um, JSPM is one that the Aureli team initially was taking a heavy dependency on. That was the only way they kind of recommended building and the way they were building the framework at first. And then during the development of uh, Aurelia, Webpack is a new system that became very popular very quickly. And so they also have support for that. So you basically have a couple of choices. You can use a combination of NPM and JSPM, which you'll find lots of samples and articles and stuff that do it this way, just because that's the way the Aurelia team started out showing everything. Um, you'll find combinations that are Webpack and NPM. So Webpack doesn't do anything in terms of pulling modules or, or packages to your machine. It just takes care of bundling them, uh, providing a dev server to run them in the development environment and doing things like that. So you still need NPM in that case to pull in the packages, but all the kind of runtime bundling compilation aspects are gonna be handled by Webpack. And then you can also just depend on NPM only. If you use the Aurelia CLI, this is actually what you're gonna be doing because the Aurelia uh, command line interface will let you generate projects and, and pull in packages and create components and stuff like that. Uh, and the way it gets all the packages in place is just through, uh, through NPM itself. Any questions so far? Very quiet, okay, yeah. Oh yeah, good point. I kind of glossed over NuGet there. So definitely for your backend projects, you know, your .NET code for your web APIs and, and if it's gonna be part of a uh, surrounding MVC application, then that stuff will all still be done with NuGet. You know, the .NET world started to kind of deviate when they were working on ASP.NET Core in the early days of that, that there was some pressure to like get away from NuGet and stuff. But they they evolved back to no you know NuGet works fine for our purposes in .NET. We're not going to try to reinvent the package system. Um, so basically, NuGet still what you would use for your backend stuff. Um, but you'll primarily use npm as your development time tooling, more like command command line tooling, as opposed to Visual Studio itself. Uh, and you can use it for client side libraries uh, as well. The uh, yeah so. So I went through that. All right, so now let's actually talk about Aurelia. So all that is just kind of some background that you really need to, you know, I've sat down, you chosen one of the, the ways I'll show you to create projects, kind of played around with it and, and get a sense of the project structure that's surrounding your code. You know, most of your code is gonna sit underneath a folder where you're defining views and view models and services uh, as part of the architecture. And you know, that infrastructure that I'm talking about now just becomes part of the background environment you're working in. 
Okay, so what does Aurelia have? It's a full end-to-end -end client side framework. So it's there to help you structure your code right, make it maintainable, keep each piece as lo loosely coupled from the others as possible, again, in the interest of maintainability, testability, and, and so on. So it's got a modular architecture um, based on the modules of ES2015. It's got a dependency injection mechanism so that you can wire up uh, the dependencies between different components in a loosely coupled way. It's got two-way data binding. Like I said, that's kind of a key feature of any client-side uh, framework these days of how am I gonna take data, data that I got from the back end or that the user is producing and put it on the screen uh, without you know, having a bunch of read-write type logic for every single control as the way I do that. Um, a really one of those fundamental design differences between Angular 2 plus and just so you know, uh, terminology-wise, the Angular team recommends you refer to anything that's 2 plus as just Angular, and anything that's 1.x, you're supposed to call it AngularJS. The problem with that is it sucks for search engine optimization and finding anything, because if you search with just Angular, you get the entire history of Angular since 1.x. So it's kind of a, a disadvantage there, but um, one of the fundamental design differences here between Angular 2 plus and Aurelia is Aurelia sticks to a, a UI separation pattern. So Angular 1 used the MVC separation pattern on the client side, and the way they did it was actually very, very similar to the way MVV, MVVM has been used in the XAML community for almost a decade now. Um, the creator of Aurelia is Rob Eisenberg, and he's got a whole team of over 20 people helping him. <coughs> Um, but he came out of the XAML world like I did as part of my preference for Aurelia. Uh, he came out of the XAML world and he had a previous framework for XAML called Caliburn and Caliburn Micro uh, that, that did a lot of the same things that are happening in the Aurelia framework. Uh, so he picked MVVM as the UI composition here. And Angular 2 doesn't actually use a UI separation pattern anymore. They use component-based architecture, which is actually somewhat reminiscent of web forms and Windows forms that you have kind of code behind that supports the markup that's going to render out a given chunk of the screen. And those two are a little more tightly coupled than something like a view model and a view would be, or a view and a controller would be. <coughs> Uh, you have to have some kind of a routing navigation system to be able to change out what the user is seeing without having to post back to the server and re-render from there. Uh, under the covers, they have these things called task queues. You typically don't have to use these directly in your own apps, but it's kind of a power hook under the covers to be able to set up a bunch of asynchronous work to kind of work off one at a time. They use this extensively in the, in the data binding system and the way they render out their templates. Uh, PubSub messaging, a lot of MVVM frameworks typically have one of these where if, I got, if I've got like a left side navigation pane and I've got a content pane on the right, selections in the left are going to change things in the right. But in this decoupled world of MVVM, you don't want one view that's in a totally separate container having a direct dependency on some other view that's in a different container. So the way you get around that is you put a middleman in between, make it so they take coupling on that middleman only as a way to broadcast and subscribe to messages to get information conveyed back and forth between the decoupled parts of the application. Uh, HTML templating, basically when you write your views in an Aurelia app, you're just creating a, a fragment, an HTML fragment. Uh, to keep kind of consistent structuring, Aurelia always have, has you put the root element in each view be the template element, which is an HTML5 feature. That's not something that renders itself, it's a, where, well, a way of declaring a chunk of markup that will kind of be used as a template to render out some content. And so they just leverage that feature for the way they render the views. Uh, custom elements, basically to encapsulate the work you've done of creating some view that maybe is reusable. Uh, you can treat that view in its view model as a web component, just like Angular components are done, and then reuse those as custom elements in surrounding markup. Same with custom attributes, a way to add functionality to an existing element. Um, for anyone with, uh, with XAML background, kind of like we, with behaviors in XAML, <laughs> where you can basically add functionality to an existing element, whether it's a, a primitive in HTML or some uh, control you're getting out of a third-party library, for example. 
and there's logging under the covers, just mainly to capture anything that's going on at a framework level and give you a hook if you want to uh, pipe that into your own logging system. By default, it just logs out to the, uh, to the debug console in the browser. Okay, so then how do I get one of these projects started? This is where there's a few too many options, honestly. Um, if you go to the docs on for uh, Aurelia, okay, sorry, I'm all tangled up here. If you go to the docs for Aurelia, they mainly focus on the CLI um, using the command line with JSPM or downloading their uh, skeleton navigation project. I'll show you quickly what all of these feel like. So, <clears throat> In terms of the code I've got here, um, let's go into the Aurelia CLI one first. And I'll just open that up, oops, in code. Now the way this gets generated is first you would clear so it's up at the top of the screen, and you would npm install Aurelia-CLI. And that would go chug and pull down some packages for you, oh I'm sorry, dash G. To, to globally install it, so you can use it from any directory on the machine. I've already done that, so I won't do that. And then you would just say AU new, and it starts asking you a series of questions. So what do you want to call your app? That's fine. Um, this is a, a new thing they slipped in there. When it comes to module loaders, I mentioned Webpack has a module loading aspect to it. Um, but with the other options, like I, I said that when you're using the CLI here, you're just using NPM, not JSPM, not Webpack. So it needs a module loading system that understands the ES2015 module loading scheme or one of the predecessors that was similar. And so either RequireJS or SystemJS are, are third-party libraries, basically other open source projects that know how to do that module loading for you. So I'll just accept the default there. Then it says, do you want to do ES next, meaning 2015 and later, uh, or TypeScript, or if you can see you can do custom and it's going to ask you more detailed questions about, you know, specifically what transpiler do you want to use, there's a couple out there, and so on. So I'll pick number two here for TypeScript. And then, do I want to create the project? Yeah, that's kind of the whole point here. And then it also asks, do you want to install all the project dependencies? So I'm going to say no to this, simply because that would go run npm install in the directory and re restore all the packages and it may take a while based on the, uh, the network here. But that's basically what you know I went through to create the CLI app originally. Um, and since I just did it, it kind of recreated as a subfolder there, this Aurelia app you can ignore, but everything's in that project or in that folder that it generated. So it does by default generate the subfolder for you. So in terms of the code we're looking at here, the root level structure, you can see there's a lot going on, uh, even though if we go run this thing, if we go look at the actual source here, all we're going to see is this is data binding to the, the view model for this, which is the AppTS, and it's grabbing one property to say hello world. So you've got, you know, God knows how many files and dependencies and config files and so on that are in here, and that's that infrastructure I was talking about that you need with these modern JavaScript apps. So this is one path, it's just gonna use NPM. It's got its own stuff under the covers to do the bundling and, and uh, transpilation and all that stuff. The other thing you can do, so let's go back to the slides briefly. So that's the Aurelia command line path, it's just NPM install globally, the Aurelia CLI, AU new to generate a new project. Within that directory, AU run to have it compile everything and serve it up uh, using a lightweight web server. Next one that I think you know most of the crowd at a Visual Studio Live type conference is going to like is something that's called JavaScript Services. If you go Google that, you'll see a link here to a GitHub project, and this is actually the ASP.NET Core team uh, is using this to put out basically, as I said before, project templates that you can either do like a lot of front-end web devs prefer these days, which is just work at the command line and your favorite editor, or you can work on the same project in Visual Studio uh, and treat it as a full up ASP.NET Core project. So to do this one, you have to first install, YO is Yeoman, it's a scaffolding tool basically, and then you have to uh, install the generator, which is the scaffolding specific to the spot templates for ASP.NET Core. Uh, 
and then you run Yo ASP.NET Core Spa, and then .NET Run or launch it from VS is the way you can get it running. So that's actually what the uh, the ZA project that I brought up at first had. So this one was generated, and the, the quick glance way of seeing is if you see a client app and a www root folder, that's the base structure of an ASP.NET Core project for a SPA, is that they create this client app subfolder. Personally, I think they get a little too crazy with the, uh, the subfolders, so if you generate the default app, they have client app, app, then components underneath that, and then another app folder under that, and that's where just the app uh, component itself goes, and then they have separate subfolders for each individual component. I kind of fall back to the folder structure I've used for years with, with Angular 1 and 2, and that is to just say, okay, I know there's somewhere is my root app folder, uh, and my app component is the top level component that's going to contain everything anyway. And so I put that at that level, and then the subfolders will be the child components that are going to load into that. Uh, just realize you're not stuck to the structure that they they initially generate there. So this one, let me get the uh, the back end is up and running. This is just a, a simple. This one's actually an ASP.NET 4.x project uh, because it supports both Breeze, which I'm going to cover in my workshop tomorrow, uh, or just straight API controllers, just uh, Web API two style controllers. So this one's not an ASP.NET Core project because of the Breeze content, which I'll go into more detail tomorrow. Um, but but the, uh, the sample app we're using, there's one of them in the folder. Uh, let's go to demos, Aurelia. So the Xi app 3 here that's in the demos, that one is just using web APIs, and the Xi app without a 3 on it is using Breeze for the, uh, the actual CRUD-centric API calls that it's doing. That's all kind of background on the on the back end that we're not going to go into detail here, but just realize this is up and running and what the uh, the client app is going to talk to. So then if I switch to that uh, ZAW folder, we'll just go to the full-blown one. And again, this one is a, uh, a .NET Core project. So I can just say .NET Run is the way I get it up and running outside of Visual Studio. Or I could ju just open this CSPROJ they generate and run it from Visual Studio. This starts it up on localhost 5000. So then I could go fire up a browser. And I'll just do this to save some typing and just change the ports. And so it sucks down and gets a, the scenario is a pizza ordering joint. So we have a list of customers with very user-friendly GUIDs right in their face. Don't do that to your users. Uh, we can edit customers, theoretically. Okay. Why didn't that bring up an edit dialog? There we go. Um, so we can go, we can edit customers. We'll just put some gobbledygook on there. We can save it, persist, persist it to the back end and load it back in and so on. Um, and we can go place orders, maybe add that pizza and this salad and this drink, and then submit our order. And now if we go look at the order history here, here we are, 2.57 p.m., the order got saved on the back end. So that's kind of the, the end user functionality that's in this example. And the way it was generated was simply using the JavaScript services template. They do have, with the latest uh, update to Visual Studio, update three, they do have a file new project, Angular project, that is using these templates uh, at the beginning. When you do this Yo ASP.NET Core part, it's going to ask you a series of questions, just like I showed with the Aurelia CLI, where it's going to ask you, like, you know, are you doing Aurelia, Angular, React? So you pick the, the top level framework first, and then it's got some, some sub questions it asks you in terms of TypeScript or ESNext, very similar to the CLI there. But the nice thing here is it's already a Visual Studio project. You know, people who want to work in that environment can work there. People who want to work from the command line and their favorite editor can work there. It doesn't force you down one path. The only downside to this one, I would say, is they're using uh, Webpack under the covers. So I mentioned Webpack as, as both a, a development environment, package management, module loading thing. So they're just kind of wrapping that in the Visual Studio project. Um, and they've got some defaults for, for the Webpack config. In fact, we can see it here in the project. 
There's a Webpack config and a Webpack vendor config for bundling up the vendor files. So you have to get kind of familiar with some of this infrastructure to do things like if I want to add in a third party library, I not only have to npm install it to get the library or the package there, uh, then I have to go add it to my uh, vendor scripts here to get it bundled when the application builds. So each one of these different options, there's you know some familiarization you'll have to do, getting familiar with what does it generate, where do I go to add third-party li libraries, where do I uh, go to say where my resources like images and fonts are, and you have to learn some of that from each one of these. Uh, and, and for this template at the current time, it's pretty much undocumented exactly what it's doing for you. It's just very black box, and they're, they're planning on improving the documentation there. But uh, this one gives you the most flexibility. And because you have direct configuration access here, once you figure out what the right config settings for Webpack are to do different things, you can go and tweak them right there. Okay, um, another option. I'm not going to uh, use it here, but like I said, this was the first option as Aurelia was first being developed and up through about half of their uh, beta time, everything was centered on JSPM. And they actually had their own pain just because JSPM would release new versions that would totally break their builds and then they'd have to go figure out why. So I think they got you know a little bit of a bad taste in their mouth from, from starting with JSPM. They still have it there for completeness. You'll still find lots of samples with it. I recommend you just forget this exists other than you know if you open a sample project and, and specifically what you would see is a config.js uh, config file is what sets up the system module loader that comes with JSPM. Um, also you would see a JSPM packages uh, folder uh, once you went and, and restored things with JSPM init here or, or JSPM install. So bottom line is lots of code out there that shows using this way. My whole course I use this by the way because <laughs> I did the whole course before it was most of the course before it was released um, but this is not what I would recommend you start with stick with either the JSS or the Aurelia CLI they also have one other you'll find on the on the docs there's a download starter project don't even use it because they basically give you a single index.html that's doing some script includes and it's nothing like what you should be doing for any production project. And it's got absolutely nothing in it in terms of sample code. Uh, it's basically got that same hello world kind of code but all stuffed together in one file, uh, which is fairly useless. Okay, so then in terms of actually, you know, using this as your, uh, as your framework of choice, first you have to get familiar with the model view view model pattern. How many people in here have used MVVM and XAML or elsewhere? Okay. Uh, if you ever use the library Knockout JS, Knockout JS was based on data binding in, in XAML for the most part, uh, trying to recreate that for the JavaScript world. And so a lot of people built MVVM based applications with, with Knockout as well. Um, for those not familiar, you know, it's, it, at a high level, it's kind of a layered architecture for your client side. It's saying the view is what the user sees on the screen, the, scr the structure of the view. So that includes your HTML markup, your CSS that's going to style things, but theoretically it should contain no logic. Now where that rule gets broken a little bit is in your data binding expressions, as, as I'll show a few examples, you can have expressions. So much like put, putting you know, script blocks in your, in your web forms or your MVC projects, Yes, you can put expressions in there, but don't put complex expressions that are really business logic or you know that have any any complexity to them. If you need to do a little ternary operator to say if this is true, I want it red; otherwise, I want it blue. Absolutely, that's that's perfectly fine. But if you're calling some you know business logic fun function that produces a value that you then pass to another function, and you're doing that kind of crazy stuff from markup, you're doing it wrong. So the view is mostly the structural aspects. The view model is where all your logic goes, and your view and view model in a, in a Aurelia app can be treated together as just a web component, a custom element that you can use in some other part of your application. Um, the way they talk together, one of the distinguishing things about MVVM versus MVC is mostly about the lifetimes of the two things, the, the view and the controller versus the view and the view model, and how they talk to each other. In MVC, it's more of an imperative thing. If you have ASP.NET MVC experience, you're used to, from your controller code, you can invoke a view and pass in a model object to it, and those model objects are often referred to as a view model. Um, 
in, uh, and so there's a more of a procedural imperative, you know, calling methods type of communication between controllers and views. Whereas in MVVM, it's mostly data binding, flowing data back and forth between the, the structure on the screen and the source of the data from behind the view model. The model objects themselves are just data objects, classes with properties in a TypeScript world, just like you would do in C-sharp or P POCOs or uh, POTOs, I guess you'd call them in uh, TypeScript. And then this layer down here, the client services, that's not officially part of the MVVM pattern, um, but it's strongly recommended for any client-side app, whether it's WPF, Silverlight, or JavaScript, that's gonna be talking to a backend. You don't want the code in your view models to get overly coupled to how data gets into the app. The view model's there to kind of supply the data to the view for rendering purposes and to handle the direct interaction of the user and figure out what to do next from a client-side logic perspective. Um, and, and so it's, you know, trying to buffer the view from being coupled uh, too tightly to anything else going on in the app. Well, the same is true about the view model and the client services. The view model need nodes, uh, the view model can say, I need customers, I want to put customers on the screen, but it shouldn't necessarily have to know how do those customers get into the app. Do I make an HTTP call to what address? Is it using something like OData as opposed to just straight RESTful HTTP calls or maybe a Breeze server? Uh, you know, those are implementation details of the how of data gets into the client side. And just like you would have a data layer to insulate your business logic from knowing how data gets into your you know, backend application, you basically have a, a client-side services layer that's how do I call my services, you know, what kind of services, and what protocols am I using, how do I deal with HTTP errors, all those things that are kind of wire level stuff. If you're putting that in your view model, you're kind of doing it wrong. The view model should just be about the interaction with the view, providing the data to the view, collecting interaction from the user and figuring out what's next. The how of all that stuff gets in there should be encapsulated uh, down into that third layer. So data binding, uh, again, kind of key feature for the MVVM pattern, very flexible data binding system in, in uh, Aurelia. This is one of the things at a, at a capabilities level that people will kind of throw out there to try to bash Angular 2 plus that is somewhat disingenuous. Angular 2 does not have a two-way data binding system, period. They only support one-way data binding. What they have is some special syntax that you can do on an input element that makes it feel like two-way data binding. It's basically just one declaration. In, in, in one declaration, you're both hooking up a, a read of a property for the one-way data binding and an event handler to push new changes to that property down into your, into your code. So it's one of these splitting hair things. It's like, oh, Aurelia is better because it has true two-way data binding, and I've been guilty of saying that myself. Um, but the fact is, it, it's not a real differentiator because it's just different syntax in Angular. And yes, it's handling it very different under the covers, um, but you know, no one way is technically better than the other. The only way you can say one is better than the other for the most part is in terms of performance. Performance is what drove the Angular team to totally abandon the two-way data binding they had in Angular 1 and go to this unidirectional data flow uh, that they have in Angular 2+. They did that mainly because their old way was much more brute force in the way it did its data bind, its two-way data binding, and so they did that for performance reasons. In Aurelia, the way they went about their data binding was totally different than the way Angular One did, and they're able to get it. You know, the performance is on par it's in some places better, in some places worse. Very specific scenarios. Both Angular and Aurelia are equivalent in terms of capabilities here, but certainly very different at the uh, at the code level what you do. The way um, Aurelia handles this to, to keep the performance good is it's got what they call an adaptive binding system. So when they're hooking up the data binding, when the code is being parsed basically, they're kind of looking at both sides of the data binding. They're saying, okay, what is this data binding trying to push values into? And where are those values coming from? And it kind of inspects both, both those things and it can tell, for example, is that just a class property on some class 
or is that a get and set block uh, in, in you know TypeScript and JavaScript syntax that's actually got a method body to it that I have no idea what that method body is doing, you know, from a you know the uh, the view compiler's perspective, it has no idea what's going on in that block, so it has to assume the worst and has to dirty check it and basically pull it uh, to get that value. But they're able to do this adaptive binding to make it so they only have only have to do that if you're basically data binding to a method where you haven't told it anything about what's inside that method. But to get around even that, they have a decorator, like a like an uh, attribute in .NET, that you can put on your properties, or on, uh, on either the get set blocks of the properties or on a method that you're gonna data bind to, and tell it, this full name property is really computed from the first name and last name properties. And once you declare that, then it basically says, okay, then I'll just watch those two properties, and anytime they change, I'll update the full name as well. So they have a, a much more intelligent data binding system than either Angular 1 or e, Angular 2 had, and that's the way they get the, the kind of performance they're getting, but still support full two-way data binding. Um, in terms of what you need to use, the nice thing here is there's only a couple of, of constructs. Um, basically, any property on an HTML element, whether it's an HTML5 primitive, some third-party library, or one of your custom elements that you've created as a view and view model pair in Aurelia, all you do to data bind that property is say dot bind and point to the expression that's going to provide a value. So let's go look at that in some code here. So if we start at a root level in this one, which would be the app.html, uh, let me get rid of this. So anyone who's done any bootstrap stuff can probably just spot this right away from the indentation in the icon bars. It's your standard nav bar uh, sample out of bootstrap to have some structure here. But as we start looking into the code, we can start seeing some of the binding expressions. So first off, uh, let's see here, where's my repeat.for? So, under the covers, I'll get to uh, routing in a, in a few minutes, uh, the router has a set of routes defined on it, and on each of those routes, you can say whether you want that to be sort of publicly exposed as part of the navigation collection on the router, as end addressable top level pages, if you will. And so this is a data binding uh, for, for a loop that says, give me that navigation array, uh, loop over it, and create a local variable called row, that I can use in other data binding expressions here to extract the values from, from one of those navigation routes. And so here you can see there's an is active flag that tells us is that the current route, and we can use that to drive the highlighting of our menus. Um, down here on the href, notice, notice I'm just doing a dot bind is what the, uh, the slide was talking about. So here just href is a property of the anchor tag, and I can bind to it. Input is the property of an, or I'm sorry, uh, value is the input value for a, an input element. So you can value dot bind. Uh, a SRC property, source property on an image, SRC dot bind. So anything where you're just trying to bind it up, whether it's one way or two way, it depends on the element. If there's some way for the user to input through that element, you just dot bind it, point it to the property in your uh, view model that you want to bind to, or the locally scope variable that here is being created because we're in a loop. So the for loop here, the repeat dot for, whoops, repeat dot for is just like setting up a for loop in your C sharp code or JavaScript code. Tell it what the collection is you're going to iterate over. It creates an instance of a locally scoped variable that is in scope for that element and all of its child elements. And that's why we can just use the, the row.href over here, href being a property of the route, the route object that this row represents, and pulling the title off as well for, for display purposes. And then down here is another one where we're just doing uh, if not bind. So if is a custom uh, attribute basically that's part of the Aurelia framework. And we're able to dot bind that to something we expect to produce a Boolean. And the if basically says, if that Boolean is true, make this element part of the DOM. If it's not true, don't make it part of the DOM. Another option you have there is show dot bind. And if you do show dot bind, then it hides or shows as the name in, implies, but it doesn't physically add it or remove it from the DOM. It's always there in the DOM. Show would just apply dis, uh, display equals none to that element uh, based on it being true. Okay, so those are the main constructs of data binding.
um, a few other places obviously with all the the data we were showing there a list of customers so if we drill down into customers here and go to this customers HTML you can see it's just using a uh, simple table oops simple table here again using some bootstrap styling and then we have another repeat dot four over a collection of customers that's exposed by this views view model and we just dot down into the properties there Notice the syntax here is different. If you've used Angular, they use a double curly brace uh, as a binding expression to inject a value into the DOM. Here they're using the same syntax as the string templates in, in Aurelia. If you remember the string templates I showed have back ticks delimiting them and then the fill in the blank pieces are dollar sign curly braces. So that's why they just chose that syntax here for Aurelia. So it's common with using string templates in your JavaScript or TypeScript code. We go to 3.30, correct? Any dissenters? Okay, thanks. Um, here's another one. So this isn't like data binding as in data is gonna flow, but it's treated as part of the data binding system or, or really the template parsing system is click.delegate down here. So this is for hooking up events, uh, any kind of event on an element, you can just dot delegate it and it's gonna hook up an event handler for that event. So that applies to like changed on input elements, uh, blur or anything like that, you can dot delegate it. Um, and it basically sets up a handler that's gonna point to whatever uh, function you say to invoke here. And notice we can also still use in that expression, we can use that local customer variable that's part of our looping that's generating instances of rows here uh, based on the collection. So we can just pass that as a, in as a context parameter basically to that method to say this is the specific customer uh, that the user wanted to delete here. Here uh, we see some other data binding that we're not doing href.bind like I showed before. We're not setting the whole value with a property value on some object, but we're gonna use a property value on, on the current looping object to formulate on the fly a relative uh, path to get to a different view passing in that customer ID. So this is just setting up anchor tags to trigger the navigation system to go over uh, to a different view. And same, same with this one down here. Okay, let me see. One more place to look at the data binding here is in the input form for a customer. Notice a couple of if.binds and show.binds up here so that we can use this for adding or editing customers and just change the display slightly. Uh, value.bind for two-way bindings on all the, all the inputs. It'll pull the value of first name you know, out of the object when it renders the screen, put it into the text block, and if the user changes that, then it's gonna push the new value down in here. It does that on a keystroke by keystroke basis by default. There are some options in the, in the data binding system to tell it to wait until a blur happens, a, a change of focus, um, or you can uh, monitor the events yourself and, and you know, manually go pull that value and put it somewhere, turning it into a one-way data binding, basically. And those all just show up in the same kind of place. If I wanted to make this a one-way data binding, I was not gonna let the user input a new value, but I wanted to you know, read it into a text box, maybe for copying purposes, one sec there. Um, I would just change this to one dash way. So there's also a dot one way, dot two way, uh, and that kind of thing on the bindings. And I mentioned it, oh, I don't mention it in the, these slides, but basically, uh, there's these overrides to specifically say what mode of binding you want if you need that. Had a question over here? Yeah, the root of each view you mean? Yeah, so up here, notice every view uh, always starts with a template. So that, that's a little different than Angular. Angular, you can just have multiple fragments in a file and it'll just render it in wherever it's supposed to go. Here they wanted to have that clean encapsulation as an HTML5 template. So you always root your views with a template and, and you try to put anything outside that and you're gonna get some compilation errors. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the kind of the client, you know, what do the data bindings look like? Let me change this back so I don't try to use it later and wonder why it's not binding right. So that gives you a sense of what the, the binding system's looking like on the markup side. On the, the logic side, the view models here, 
the, the convention here is just have it the same name side by side with the view. So you always have your HTML and your TS file. And you might have also you can uh, define either CSS less or SAS files at an individual component level. And there's just some syntax you use to pull those in with the require. <coughs> 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 Sorry, give me a sec. <coughs> um, there is some syntax you can use. In fact, let me see, do I have it anywhere? <coughs> yeah. So similar to what I'm doing here for pulling in these components that I'm going to use, this is a, uh, these are converters. So you have data binding converters. If, if the value coming out of your model object is not exactly how you want to present it on the screen, maybe you want to turn a, uh, you know, a Boolean true false into a red green indication. You have these things called converters you can create as reusable elements that'll take in a value of some type and some value and let your code transform that into a different value. But the same syntax here can be used to pull in a CSS or last, uh, less or SAS file to say this is the styling just for this component. And in the browsers that support it, it'll actually use the shadow DOM to, to isolate those things. Okay, so on the logic side then, let me go back over here. Well, let's take one that's a little simpler first. So the one that's just listing out the customers um, first and foremost, it's a class that is your view model instance. This is an example of a decorator. So in Aurelia, they use an inject decorator to basically say, I'm, I'm going to need an instance of a ZA repository, an HTTP client, and a router injected into this class. And where it's going to expect to inject those is through the constructor. So if you're new to TypeScript here, uh, TypeScript has constructors like C Sharp, but they use a constructor keyword instead of the class name uh, as the method name, if you will. So this is basically a, you know, position order based injection that we know the first variable is going to be an instance of a ZA repository, second one a router, and that doesn't even match up, does it? <coughs> <coughs> All right, so kind of dead code there from probably something I was doing earlier on in this sample. But I'll get rid of that HTTP client because we weren't actually using it anywhere in the view model. Because like I said, you should put your HTTP calls down in that client services layer. And what I was keying on there, if you didn't pick up on it, let me put it back, is if I try to use my router anywhere in here, and I, I do, um, that would have screwed things up because it's going to say the, the second thing it was going to inject would have been an HTTP client and it's trying to stuff it into the router position here. Okay. So then your class, this is a class property, one of those things that's not ECMAScript standardized yet, but TypeScript standardized. You declare those and TSLint will recommend you put them before your constructor. Uh, and because this is TypeScript, you know, we could put private on here if we were not going to data bind to it from our view, if it was just something that's going to be used internally here. Uh, but the customers in particular are going to be used. Notice that the ZA repository, my injected reference to my client services layer, that's only going to be used in this, this uh, view model code. So it's encapsulated as a private variable. And this syntax is TypeScript specific. It's a way of basically declaring the variable for injection and declaring a property all in one shot by putting the, the uh, private on there. It basically says I now have a private variable named repository that you can see I'm using down below with the, this reference. And then the rest of it is just methods uh, that can be called either from the code in the markup or remember I mentioned that Aurelia is very uh, config, uh, convention over configuration based. So there's a whole application lifecycle or really a component lifecycle associated with each one of your views and view models. And the way you can do custom things, like if you want to wait and, and say, you know, I'm on one view and someone's trying to navigate, navigate to this view, and maybe there's some logic that this view can check and say, well, you haven't completed step two in the wizard yet, so you can't load step three. 
Uh, the scan activate is a hook that if you have a method called can activate on your view model, Aurelia will discover that and it will call that to get back a yes or no kind of answer um, of should it navigate to this view or not. So you can kind of reject navigation through can activate. So there's also can deactivate on the leaving side if you're on a view and the user hasn't saved their work, for example, and you don't want to navigate away and lose that work, then you can use a can deactivate to say, no, first I got to prompt my user. And any of these lifecycle hooks, you can either just return a, a straight value like this, or you can return a promise that produces a value, uh, and, and it will wait on that promise to complete, look at the value, and then decide. So that's where you have that opportunity to, for example, pop a dialogue to the user, because this thing's just going to be imperatively invoked and has to return something immediately, not to block the application. But what it returns could be a, 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 a promise to a method that's going to go pop a dialogue to the user, wait until they get around to you know, answering, clicking yes or no, and then it's gonna finally produce the, the true value that will let the navigation proceed. So you can always return either a con concrete value or a uh, promise-based value from any of these. One other difference at a high level for anyone who's been looking into Angular 2 is Angular 2 is very heavy usage on uh, what are called observables, which came out of the react reactive extensions for .NET that were created back a ways. They also created reactive extensions for JavaScript, and that's now RxJS, and Angular takes a heavy dependency on those. So there's observables everywhere in Angular apps. Uh, the Aurelia framework stuck mainly to promises. There's a few places they're using uh, for kind of peripheral stuff they've added on since where you can use observables. You can certainly integrate RxJS and use it however you want, you know, if, if you're familiar with it because uh, you can always wrap a uh, promise in an observable, basically make a promise turn into a one-time fired observable. Um, so you can do things that way to, to do different compositions and things you can do with RxJS. But out of the box, there's no observables in the, in the main constructs of Aurelia. All right, so that's a look at data binding. Uh, in terms of the routing and navigation, most of the slides here are just for your reference afterwards. I'm just gonna focus on the code to wrap up. So if we look at our uh, app level component logic, we can see we have a method here called configure router. And this is another one like the lifecycle hooks I was talking about. If you simply declare a method with the right signature and the right name in your view model, Aurelia will discover it and, and, and call it at the appropriate time. And so the way this works, if you remember the running application here, when I went to, whoops, go back to customers and say place an order, this is basically child navigation down here. I've got top level navigation happening where I can go from the customer's view to placing an order to all, all orders. So those are top level routes. And then when I'm on the place order route, this view has its own child routing system with a product view that's being rendered with three different initial collections, one for pizza, one for salads, and one for drinks. So the navigation system of Aurelius supports, you know, uh, child navigation n levels deep. Uh, it also supports having side-by-side -side containers where you say for uh, container A, I wanna go to view B, and for container C, I wanna go to view D. Um, getting all my letters mixed there, but uh, you get the idea. So there can be side-by-side -side navigation, there can be nested navigation through the routing system. And basically all you do, is any any view that's going to have child content that gets navigated uh, through the you know through the addresses that show up in the address bar? You define a configure router method on that uh, view model. It takes in a config object and a router. Usually, you'll hold on to that router for things like generating the menus or the tabs that I have for pizza, drinks, and salads. Um, and then you set up the routes through the config object. And you can see each route basically has a, a URL fragment that will identify it from the root. So the empty quotes here means, you know, if we just go to the root of our site, we're gonna render, render out the customer's module. If we go to all orders, then we're going to that module. Um, in TypeScript, you need this extra platform.module name. They added that fairly recently, and I'm not sure why it's required, but, but it is. Uh, to properly resolve, but you can see from there, it's just a relative path really to a file. That's really just saying from my current directory, 
go down into customers and go to customers.ts. So when it, when it lists a module like that in an import statement at the top like these up here, um, or with the, with the routes, the route definitions I'm showing here, this is really just a relative path to a file that's going to be treated as an ES 2015 module and will be loaded and only the exported things in it will be accessible. And for each, uh, each route, you can give it a name. Uh, there's programmatic ways to, to go to that route by name. And this is that flag I mentioned when we were doing the, uh, the repeat for to generate the, the menu items. And I said there's a navigation collection that we were iterating over. This is what determines if, whoops, this is what determines if one of those routes ends up in that collection as a sort of publicly addressable route in the navigation collection. All right, we're just about out of time. Um, like I said, any level, any view model, and, and the other piece of this I didn't show is how does the view know where to place those routes, the, the child views that are going to be loaded up, and that's done with a uh, router, where to go? Oh, I'm in the wrong, so let's go to orders. And the top level one is the uh, order here and notice it has this router view. It's just a container, think of it as a div that's going to contain the, the views when they're navigated to that are specified by the routes in this view model's configure router. So this is setting up the child, child navigation for pizza, salads, and drinks. You can see in all cases it's just using the products uh, view and view model. And what's happening is when that navigation happens, uh, we go down into the products, we can see there's a products array here, and that gets populated by basically stripping off part of the route to figure out are we doing pizza, salads, or drinks, passing that in to get products to filter down what it's going to return, and then using that to populate its own products collection for that given instance of the view. So it shows a number of different combinations there of, of composing views, view models, and navigating between them. And then the last part I, I kind of talked about in the code there uh, is the inject decorator. The way you get a reference to something when you do this, it's a singleton by default. Uh, if you read, read through the uh, dependency injection information in the docs, you'll see that you can control the instancing so you can get a new instance every time it's injected. By default, it's going to be a singleton. Um, and so we just use this inject decorator, say, take an instance of a sum service and pass it into the constructor here. This snippet doesn't show type information, so this is ES2015 compatible code. Throw the type of sum service on here, and now it's TypeScript. All right. So wrapping up, um, if you want a lot more detail and end coverage, one, come to my workshop tomorrow is one way to get it, uh, or two, go check out my course on Pluralsight. Again, brian.noise at gmail. If you don't have a subscription, shoot me an email. I'll get you one month pass. And the links for those two comparisons, again, if you want more detail there. And they have very good docs at uh, Aurelia.io. They have a blog where they, every time they're doing a new release, they kind of outline, outline what they're doing. Um, and there's also a Gitter channel. Uh, Gitter is just yet another Slack, whatever kind of, uh, you know, uh, communication tool. They have a Gitter channel with thousands of people on it. Using Aurelia is the best place to go to say, how do I do X? Um, and, and also Stack Overflow. They've got, you know, people uh, from the core team monitoring that as well. So thanks for your attention. Slides and demos link. Fill out your evals and enjoy the rest of the conference.